23rd of March of 1997, which happened to be Palm Sunday. And the act of uh, declaring it a peace community was witnessed by international observers, Dutch, particularly Dutch, um, that felt very connected to the town, and members of the church. Uh, the idea of becoming a peace community was actually uh, fueled and supported by the local church, which may be an interesting uh, um, piece of information. The local church was very proactive in supporting their right to declare themselves neutral. Now, um, then after that, a week after that, a bombing started. Helicopters started to come, so selected targets were um, uh, determined. Two years after that, they did not have international observers at that moment. Two years after that, the members of the community decided to establish contacts and request the presence of international observers. And they had national observers, but they have international observers. The, at that moment, the PBI and the Fellowship of Reconciliation started to go, and they actually created um, a house where, uh, where uh, they go. This is the FOR, the FOR mansion in uh, one of the hamlets. <laughs> It's absolutely adorable. It's, uh, to, to me, it was a really, a, a, it's, it's really an amazing place. It's really amazing to go to a place inhabited by 500 people with a house that says FOR. It really is amazing. And you are witnessing the big, bad international observer that intimidates the army. That blonde, that very cute blonde there, does it. She was alone there for six months. And for as long as there is an international observer, no army, no paramilitary, no guerrilla, there's coming. Now, where do people get killed then? They get killed in the places in between hamlets. They get killed when they had to leave the hamlet and go to the main town. <coughs> They get killed on the way back on the bus. So one of the many strategies of the community is that they work the fields in groups of four. It, it became a rule. You work the fields in, in numbers of four. So everybody comes, uh, goes and comes together. So that, and again, you see again the same idea, so that there are witnesses. It's not that I will guarantee that no offense is done but it will guarantee that there are witnesses. And with that system of witnesses, actually, actually, the direct attacks have diminished. Do we have a guarantee that they will continue to diminish? No. Actually, one of the fundamental uh, needs for the community is the needs of visitors. It's really, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as somebody growing up Catholic, I know the meaning, the profound meaning of hosting, right? Actually, Catholic in one, in one way means universal welcoming. Yeah, in practice it wasn't like that. But it's a good... <laughs> no. uh, the Guaranis and the Incas and the Aztecs don't think so. Yeah. But, um, but the principle of welcoming, the universal welcoming, and being a host is a beautiful, the guest is a beautiful idea. Well, for this town, and this is actually very moving, for this town actually having visitors is the difference between life and death. <laughs> because when I visit, I acknowledge you. I acknowledge your presence. And with my presence, I acknowledge the importance of you being there. So it's very important to, for them to have visitors from Colombia and from outside, right? So does that answer your question, Martin? And th there was another part of your question. The question was, did the incidence of violence uh, go down as a result of becoming uh, a peace community? I, I think I will have like two answers for that question. The, the one answer will be, no, actually, it's like this. 
It's no way to know at one level. It's no way to know because which ones are you going to compare? That's one answer, but here's the other answer. Before that, people were displaced, lost their land, and ended up in the city of Bogota without any resources. And the killing was systematic and with complete impunity. Once they become a peace community, actually there is a record, there is a memory, there is, there is a constant dialogue with the government and a constant calling, remember, no, no to injustice. There is a systematic uh, record of um, aggression and a systematic um, appeal to the government in name of those aggressions. Before being a peace community, it, this is a difference. Is the difference between Martin being attacked and the Shambhala community being attacked. As a member of community, your power is tenfold. And power here in the most positive sense of power. In other words, as, and I really do believe this to be the case, as they created themselves a community, they became a Sangha. And I really do mean that, they really did. So before it was Jose and Maria, and those are two peasants, and they disappear, and oh well. Now, as members of a community, that memory will not go away, and that name will not be forgotten, and there will be implications. So there has been all of this, all of this history of actually teaching the paramilitaries and teaching the army that if you kill Jose, we will actually talk to the U.S. government which may or may not do anything, but actually may give you bad publicity in the meantime. And actually in one case, there was a massacre, I'm talking, I'm looking at Lynn, but um, it's to everybody, there was a, Lynn, did, did I say, uh, five years ago there was a terrible massacre of five people um, that, that now they actually um, remember every year with a pilgrimage that I will be a part of next year. But um, the, the army did it, um, but the president blamed the guerrillas, which th most definitely the guerrillas really do work really well with the government in the sense that they are a perfect... Uh, yes, a perfect shadow, yes, yes. So it, it really, you don't, that's what is a protracted war. At one level, and this is what you discover, and this is what you discover in situational war. The guerrillas do need the paras, and the paras do need the guerrillas because they are feeding off each other's hatred. Exactly. Cycles. And in cycles. So what happened is that um, the members of the community had proved that it was not a para the army, but uh, that it was not a guerrillas, but it was the army and the paramilitaries. And they recorded those and wrote about those evidence and called international lawyers. And uh, a, a, a following uh, happened. And then actually, four years later, the commandant, the, I'm sorry, the officer in charge of the massacre confessed. That was one thing. And the other thing is that um, through FOR, there was lobbying to the U.S. government to reduce the military aid to that particular group of militaries in that zone. They, that's called the Brigade 17. So actually, the aid was reduced. And for the first time, for the first time, I think, the army found out that if you kill peasants, you may not get money. That's, that's a, terrible, a terrible thing to say that they're just learning that and that actually it's a, a matter of money. But that has been done through international solidarity. This is fundamental. Our solidarity with them is fundamental, but also their solidarity with us. Because every visitor <coughs> who goes to that community learns more and gets more than she or he ever receives. And I know that's my case. And we, I have, with us, we have somebody who went with me to a community, Nathan. Nathan went back after listening uh, to me speaking in Naropa about the community last semester about eight times. Uh, Nathan and a friend of Nathan, Emily, decided to go with me and decided to bear witness and decided to check out for themselves. They are following the principle of not knowing. Well, this is what I say, but they want to find out. So they went with me. And they actually raised money to go. 
and paid the whole trip.